The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Dimensional Fund Advisors, ABN 46065 937 671, ASFL 238093, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. This series is brought to you by Dimensional Fund Advisors, a global leader in systematic investing. Since 1981, Dimensional has been applying financial science to investing and supporting financial professionals with time-tested solutions they can count on. The benefits of Dimensional investing can be accessed in a wide range of vehicles, from managed funds, to ETFs, to model portfolios. Dimensional works with financial professionals to deliver better results and help them grow successful, client-focused businesses through investment, client communication, and business strategy support. We call it Dimensional 360. Welcome to this wonderful series on the value of advice. Uh, I am joined here this morning uh, by Kelsey Dent and Tanil um, Lasser. Oh, Lannister. No, I'm not watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a real great one. It's Laster. <laughs> Laster. Well, that's not that far off in my defense. <laughs> I'm very sorry, Tanil. Welcome to you both. How are you? So good. Thank you very much for having us, Brennan. Yeah, it's really, really exciting to be here. Not a problem at all. We're, we're keen to, to get stuck in. Um, uh, I'm not sure who wants to go first, but we'd love to hear a little bit about uh, the two of you individually and uh, the practice you're from at Alton Partners. Yeah, I can start out if you like. So um, as you know, my name is Tanil and um, I've been working with Allman Partners now for 15 years um, and we have a practice now that has uh, around about nine advisors and we've been in operation for over 30 years. So we started out when, when the firm started, there was five of us back when I first started 15 years ago. So halfway through that journey, we could call it. And um, we've grown considerably over that space of time uh, and now have around about 30 um, total members. So we look after roughly 750 clients at this point in time. Um, and yeah, I'm a financial advisor and director in the firm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. And Kelsey? Yes. So as you know, my name is, is Kelsey Dent and I've been at Allman Partners for about seven and a half years. Um, so I've, I've certainly seen that growth over that period of time. I think we've almost doubled in size during that, that period. Um, and yep, yeah, financial advisor and recently joined the partnership this year too. So very exciting. All very new. Thank you very much. Um, and probably just to add to um, what Tanil had said about the firm as well, we've also in the past couple of years expanded our office from Mackay to Brisbane, um, which is going really, really well. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, unless I'm otherwise mistaken, you two are wonderful podcast hosts yourselves. Is that right? We try our best. But yes, we have a, <laughs> have a podcast called Wealth Experience. So uh, we've been we've been dabbling this year. So you'll have to bear with us. We're still relatively new. <laughs> right. And is it a client facing audience? Um, who, who's it intended for? Yeah, so we've um, our audience is is clients, um, general public. So the idea of our our podcast is to give a good broad understanding about finance, but in a way that talks more to um, achieving true wealth. And so you know the the emotions, the behaviours, particularly behind finance, and um, and how you can work your way through that. Excellent, excellent. Well, look, that's uh, not too distant from the topic which we're going to be talking today. Uh, so today we're running through episode three of this series, uh, which is embracing uncertainty, uh, guiding clients through market or uh, turmoil. And that's something which all of us have, as advisors have had to do um, at some point unless, uh, well, no, I was going to say unless you just joined the profession. But then even then, I think the last quarter hasn't been, or at least the last month market performance hasn't been too crash hot. So uh, yes, even if you just joined in the last month, uh, you've already you, probably seen a little bit of turmoil. <laughs> that's right. And you could do exactly what I did, which was join right in the middle, you know, right at the start of the global financial crisis. So nothing like a baptism of fire. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, look, I, I, I'm keen to jump into to this topic. And 
and just sort of start from start from the top. And I think just understand, you know, what is what is going through the client's mind when we when we come across market turmoil. Um, how do we how do we help them navigate through that? And and what are the sort of sort of tools and tactics that that you have found in your experiences work really well? Um, I'm keen to sort of jump in and see where uh, where this is resonating with you and and the types of things that you're working on uh, in this area. Yeah, and this is a really fantastic topic, and there's lots to unpack within that. Um, just the other day, I actually had a client ask me, "Have you that, had a lot of inquiries in you know with the whole Israel Hamas war happening?" And it was actually really easy for us to answer that question and say, no, that's that's actually not the case because our clients have been really good at weathering all different types of market, political um, and world events. So we don't really see the panic. Um, and that's not to say, say that that doesn't happen because we're all susceptible as humans to the worries and the what ifs of the world, especially when there is chaos. Um, and I think the reason for that um, is because for our clients with the short-term market volatility, it's largely what we do is address it up front. So there's a lot of front loading with the education. So when they first engage with us, um, we really set that scene around what to expect from the investment experience as a, you know, a really big focus in those initial meetings. Um, so this would be on things such as, you know, how do markets work, where the returns come from, how are their portfolios constructed and why, so that they can understand that market volatility is a given at some stage in their investment cycle. And then they're equipped to deal with it when it does happen. And I reflected on the comment that this client had made, and it really solidified that the messaging that we're giving must be working. And in terms of the education, then, Tanil, I know that that's something that we do on an ongoing basis too. Yeah. So I, I guess what we do really, really uh, well is provide education to our clients. And this is something that I think lots of, lots of advice firms do, but we really do believe that education is key. So um we don't spend a lot of time in our client meetings talking to, you know, what's happening in markets and, and trends and economic conditions. But what we do articulate really well is what are those key messages that we have a belief in as a firm? And uh, we, we say them over and over again, just with a slightly different tilt each way. Um, and this is an area that, you know, it's fascinating to me um, because it starts to unpack and help you understand those behaviours behind money like we're talking about. So for, for, for any of our listeners, one of my favourite books that I talk about a lot is um, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Uh, it's a great, yeah, it's a great way way to start your journey in that space or just to add on, you know, where, where you're already at. But um, we know as advisors that emotion plays into financial decision making as it does for for every other area of our decision making. And so um, if you can truly link those values that your clients have in the, in the emotions that present themselves at different times, you can start to understand what it is that your client's seeing in the in the lens that they look at their own world and um, what they actually need from you when it comes to these hard points in time with markets. Yeah, which yeah. Is, is interesting but point actually to now because when we're thinking about clients' reactions and feelings during these sorts of times, it often comes back to their thought processes around money and then it's about understanding the values um, that, that, that are pinned to this that actually drive those behaviours and thought processes too. So. Brendan, what I would say is that one bit of strategy advice doesn't really happen for our clients um, until we've completed the exercise to determine what those values are and how that links to their thoughts and beliefs around money. Um, and it doesn't actually have anything to do with their tangible goals or what they're wanting to achieve, but more so everything to do with what enables to do things that's important to them, such as you know their family values or spend more time with their family, whatever that may be for each individual. And it's a really brilliant way of getting to know what their truths and templates are, which then drives the behaviours. And during that process, we actually get to see and understand a lot of what the client's um, histories are. So their upbringing, their scars from their past, maybe how their parents handled money. And a big part of that then, of course, drives what their thought processes are too. Um, so I did actually have a client reveal to me that their values were to make sure that their children never go without their parents had moved from one country um, to another and they'd struggled to make it financially and um, they wanted to make them proud and they didn't want to have to go through the same hardship. And why is then that important to market volatility? So for that same client, any dip in the value of that asset that they've worked really hard to build and had a strong sense of attachment to because of their, their, their history um, 
if there was volatility, it would be a sense of failure in themselves. So for that type of client, because we know this information, um, we might spend a little bit more time during market volatility to actually give them a bit more support and understanding around what that means for them um, than someone that we would that would be optimistic about their financial decisions. So yeah, it's really, really, really interesting about how that actually comes back to the value and human behavior. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, given that it's something that we all face, uh, I'm just wondering with a with maybe a more skeptical hat on here for a moment. I'll say, well, yeah, sure, but you know, everybody comes, all clients come with an expectation to grow their wealth, right? Um, nobody likes seeing it go backwards. Uh, so to have very few people calling up in times of market turmoil, like like you guys are saying you're having, I, I don't think that's the main experience. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know, but it would it would seem that that's a really good outcome. Are you pinning that down purely to the process of understanding somebody's history? Is that really enough to shield them against, uh, you know, saying, you know, maybe a million dollar portfolio go, go down to 800 grand? You know, that, that can be quite a scary thing uh, yeah, it's for, a- for a lot of people like we saw in, say, 2022. Yeah, oh, sorry, and it's point. definitely it's definitely not saying that there's there's not clients out there that um that have those emotions because it's absolutely the, the case. But all we're talking to here is um what are some some of the things that have we've seen some benefits in as a firm that have have seen a, a, a big reduction. In it. But the reality is you're still going to have clients that uh that have those emotions uh, tied to it. And in actuality, um there's a really good point around um body language in all of this as well because. Whether that's seen or unseen, because you know when we're not, when we don't have those, those clients in front of us, and we're not hearing from them or or whatnot, um, we know that sometimes not saying anything is just as just can be just as hard as as somebody voicing up and going, "I'm feeling really, really, really bad about this experience." Um, and we know that what we do well as advisors is provide coaching rather than finance advice. Um, so at times when there is market volatility getting in there and providing that coaching is really important. And if you do have the ability to do it face-to-face, just to talk a little little more on that sort of body language area, and we and I'm sure that people do this very well, but if you've got the ability to to sort of read into the nonverbal cues, we know that nonverbal cues make up, you know, 55% of what people are actually trying to get across in their messaging. You know, I think Alan Pease is great in this area. He's, a, he's an Australian writer. Um, and he's got a large number of work. He he does some TEDx talks on the area of body language. Um, right. I think that's a great space for advisors to get some some extra tools in their kit to get to understand what clients may not be saying at times. You know, I, I did have a client that came in in the middle of the COVID pandemic and I asked them the question, you know, how are you feeling about these things? And the wife kind of said to me, yep, yeah, everything's fine. Like, what can we do about it? You know, so we feel fine about it. And the husband was sitting there and he was nodding and the power of being able to stop at times like that and say nothing. So I said, okay, and sat back and left the silence. And what happens in the silence is people feel the need to to fill it right, um, and so she ended up saying to me, "Well, actually, he's been watching his balance go up and go down, and when it goes down, he's telling me that it's been a bad day." And then he was, he said, "Yeah, I, I'm not sleeping very well at times like that." So, um, what does that let me do as an advisor? Then, well, I, I can get in and provide that education. It gives me the ability to go, okay, well, what what happens if it's worse than this tomorrow? So, if you've seen a twenty percent fall in your market value. What happens if that volatility is more tomorrow? Um, what contingencies and strategies do we then have in place that can let us get through periods of time like this? Right? Because what? How does that translate back to our clients? It may not just be that they're feeling uncomfortable about how markets are moving, but more so about what is this impact on my personal goals. So I've said to you, I want to go and do some some travels next year, um, or I want to buy a car, or I I would like to slow down from work, or whatever the case may be. How how do, how as an advisor can I explain to them that I've got contingencies in place so that you don't have to stop doing those things? Yeah, sure. So you're so I guess what you're telling me here is that you need a broader range of tools than what might be ordinary or necessary, uh, maybe like logic. <laughs> That yeah. a lot of us will rely upon, right? Because it's what we do every day. Um, but you need broader uh, things to be able to draw upon to help unlock those conversations that are actually going to change behavior. Is that is that a fair summation? 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot that we do in the background that I think sometimes we don't bring to the forefront and explain to our clients well enough, right? So we know that if we're building a strategy, you know, if we build a strategy and we say that this, you're going to get from point A to point B, um, and we, if markets do X, Y, Z, and I, you know, put all these sets of assumptions around it, but I also build in the background contingencies so that when markets do go through turmoil, that my client isn't derailed. So if I'm talking about now those short-term goals, and it might be something like a you know going on a, a, a travel or whatever the case may be, um, you know I've probably got an example where I've got a client that I saw just recently, and they have a typically higher level of growth assets than what I would usually see in a client of their age and life stage. And right. the reason for that, as, a, as, a, as advisors, we know that there's going to be those cases because we can't just look at risk capacity. We can't just say, you know, um, that this is one facet. I need to think about things like the risk tolerance and I need to think about things like the risk required. And in this case, if the client has a high need for a high level of risk because they're still accumulating assets, yeah. um, but they, don't, they may not have the time I've got to have some real contingencies in my in my back pocket because I've got a short horizon and there's a huge huge ability for markets to go through that volatility. But what if they do? You know, what if that happens at the time when they need access to the capital? And they they can be the simplest of things. So at, at the meetings, the review meetings I'm doing with this client, we're talking a lot to what those contingencies are. So in this case, they have um, a home loan that has nothing but redraw facility left on it. Um, and we're keeping that alive. So it's a, that's a really easy strategy, you know, keep keeping it with $500 in it there so that if they do get to a point where they need to draw on their capital, let's take it from there firstly if share markets are doing terribly and mm-hmm. allow markets to go through their cycle and for that to recuperate. Um, and, and you don't need to change your your goals. You don't need to derail yourself because markets are going through this. And I think if advisors are continually messaging what it is they're doing in the background as the what ifs, you know, what if this happens, I'm going to bring out this strategy for you. That can help really calm some of those nerves. Yeah, sure. I sure. guess as well, the same is is true, right? In terms of, you know, people might be worrying um, around what the short term is going to do to the long term, to the bigger picture of the, their life and how they get to those those goals. So one of the tools that we do use in that space is our Monte Carlo projections, um, mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, doing the straight line projections where, you know, we're perhaps not accounted for um, the volatility and, and showing, you know, what that journey might look like with a range of different outcomes. Um, so one of the tools that we have got is is it's based on the dimensional um, returns program. Um, and we then build that out into um, something that's more easy to show our clients and um, it gives them a healthy range where we expect them to fall within. And we call that the kind of healthy zone. And that factors in in the background or the standard deviation around, you know, what can happen long term in that type of portfolio. And it's a really simplistic picture, but it's really brilliant to use when we do see the turbulence because we can show them then, well, this is how you're actually tracking towards your long term plan. And we have factored in that there's going to be the ups and downs in markets. And this is the zone that we expect you to be in. So at least then they can have some perspectives to go, okay, well, maybe it's not been a great 12 months in markets and you know everything's a little bit uncertain. But for me and my plan, I'm still within that healthy range. Um, so it might make you then feel a little bit more comfortable around what that means for you in, in the long term. And we find that a really good tool to use. And it kind of takes away from the returns conversation towards the goal and the long-term outcome that we're trying to achieve. Sure. I mean, when you started and said, well, we're using Monte Carlo tool, I thought, oh, I, if someone's feeling scared and they get, you know, a Monte Carlo sort of simulation thrown at them, I was really <laughs> skeptical that that was going to help anybody. When you told me about the health zone and it was green and you could see how you're going sort of in a broad band, I was like, okay, right. That makes, that like makes a lot more sense. Yeah, there's some yeah. there's some great ones out there. We've seen other firms that use you know probability um, modeling in different ways. So you know that probability analysis that says even in times when markets are falling, you know, and if we throw in there huge market crashes, um, what does that do to the port to, to the portfolio and to the ability to get to the goals? Um, and I think being able to equip clients with an understanding that. Um, Getting used to the negatives is is more important because of the way that humans work. We we tend to you know twicely weight the the negative emotion when when things are turning sour than what we do the positives. Um, so getting them used to the negative is a far better uh, starting point than trying to 
talk to the good returns. Yeah. I almost wish that Daniel Kahneman didn't discover that and then we wouldn't have been quite so depressed about it. But <laughs> <laughs> I suspect it was there all along and he's just found it for us. But yeah, yeah, you're right. Obviously, that that the loss is far more impactful. I'm curious. It sounds like you're doing a bunch of great things in helping people have a, have a good investment experience. Um, and I'm wondering how much of that might have to do with the sort of information that your clients become conditioned to because I get the sense maybe that sometimes, you know, if you are seeing a client twice a year, uh, you have an hour meeting and you spend 45 minutes of it talking about, you know, up, updated economic information or sort of, you know, market events and things that have been transpiring. While that might be interesting, I think it's fair to say that not a lot of that is necessarily shifting portfolio decisions. Um, you know, even if you have a say a, a very active investment philosophy, um, you know, you're not changing your portfolio based on every GDP number that comes out. Um, I wonder how much of it has to do with the sort of information we regularly provide and the structure of our meetings and what we focus on is sort of building these sorts of expectations with clients. And I just wonder, and be keen to hear your thoughts. Have you guys considered that? And if so, what were your main conclusions? And and then how how does it influence the design of your meetings, the content of the information? And you've already sort of spoken a lot about focusing on goals and moving away from sort of just exactly what's happened over the last quarter, six months or last financial year. Yeah, look, I think there's a lot of different things that we're using in meetings because, you know, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head that human information retention is pretty bad, right? So um, we know that it's- Well, mine is. I, I don't know about everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's studies that back you up. Um, Thank you. What, what's it say? Herman, Herman um, Ebbinghaus, I think it is. Um, I'm probably saying the name wrong. I'm bad with names. But he did a study in the area and it talks about the, you know, the learning curve and how quickly information slips away. Um, and, you know, for, for most people- after the end of one day, roughly, you know, uh, um, half of that's gone. And then at the end of the week, it's something like only 10% that really remains there. So it's it's hard to be up against those odds, particularly like you say, when um, you're in a meeting and you might spend, you know, an hour and a half, two times a year with a client, um, that's going to be 0.03% of their time. Um, that you're actually out there getting that messaging to them. Um, and you're you're up against some really steep odds as well too, because a lot of the information content that's thrown at people, I think I think we're consuming something like seven hours a day worth of worth of content. And that comes from you know screens, so computers, it comes from TV, it comes from radio. Those are the big three. And so for us as a firm, we try to understand that if clients are getting that information thrown at them, whether they're looking for it or not, we need to make sure that we're a big part of that sphere. So the only way that you do that is by being really content heavy. Um, so we've got we've got our podcast. We've, we, we're on the local radio. Uh, we do regular blogs. We do video blogs with with our clients during during COVID. So that's probably a really good time to talk to what were some of the additional things that we're we're doing even outside of meetings because meet, meetings are meetings are kind of the easiest space. You can you can structure that however you like, but you've only got the, the hour and a half or two hours or however long you're spending. But yeah. it's times when when markets get really ter- turmoil, uh, go through turmoil, or, or when they're away from you or they're having those crib room meetings that it's about trying to get get your your content back in front of them. So, um, Kels, maybe you could talk a little about what we did during COVID um, in terms of engaging with the audience then. Yeah, so I think COVID was actually a really big step for us to go, we need to be a little bit more proactive in the communication that we're getting out to our clients. And of course, using a different format, as many people were forced to do during that time as well. So we introduced some additional content that was a little bit out of the norm because we wouldn't usually spend a great deal of time um, outside that initial kind of front loading of education when they first engage with us around how the world markets and economies affect their investment and their experience. Um, So we did a lot of online seminars and they were over Zoom and they were recorded too for our clients that weren't able to attend. So it was a live Zoom session um, and that went out to our entire client base. 
And we had a really good take up with that actually. And not only did we offer it to clients, but we actually then sent it to um, and offered that experience to any of the retained contacts that we had. So our prospective clients and our COIs as well. And the value that we got in the feedback was was excellent and it really calmed the nerves of the audience. Um, so you're right, it's not because we've done a lot of education that our clients aren't worrying. We definitely need to be out there in front of them because they're getting that information regardless. Um, but I think there's a lot of merit in doing it in a timely manner um, and actually being able to give people what they, what they want to be talking about. Um, so off the back of that, we also then did a lot of client surveys particularly when we do have the market volatility. we um, It allows then the clients to give us feedback in the key areas that they want that specific information on so that we can find a way of um, helping them unpack that in a more direct and intentional way rather than just general information that we think they might be wanting to hear about. And, and uh, I'd love to know, Kelsey, what, what were some of the main things that your client base said that they wanted to hear from you guys? Yeah, so we... Um, as part of our ongoing review meetings as well, we do actually ask our clients for net promoter scores, which is is pretty typical of, of many firms. Um, but in particular, some of the commentary that I've had, and it goes both ways. Some people say, nope, it's great. I don't want any more information. We're, we're completely comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but then on the other end of the spectrum, you have people that say, well, we actually want more of that commentary around you know, the macroeconomics and what your thoughts and opinions are. And um, again, it's, not because, and this is a conversation I'd actually recently had with a client, the feedback was, um, you know, we're going to rate you an eight out of 10 because we want to, we want to hear your comments on that. And it's not because we don't believe in the way that you're doing things or distrust um, your investment philosophy, um, but we just want to reaffirm what those beliefs are. Um, so off the back of that, we're actually considering using our investment committee, which is a little bit of a unique aspect of Allman Partners that we do have that investment committee um, to put out a little bit more technical content for those that want it and perhaps create that as a sub subscribed service. So you're not actually overloading the people that don't want to hear too much about yeah. that. Um, but then you're able for the people that want to, that they can subscribe to receive it. Yeah, right. Excellent. And a lot of a lot of the um, during that time, Brennan, um, there was just such an unnerving about everything in the world, right? So it wasn't just about finance. It wasn't just that clients were going, oh, "I'm really worried about what's happening with my portfolio." It's just that I don't know if I'm going to wake up tomorrow and things are going to be the same as they are today because yesterday they weren't. So for for many of our clients, it was. I think a lot of it was. To just about the the personalization of that and then feeling like they're in this with someone else. Mm. Um, so there wasn't a, a heap of, you know, well, what's going to happen tomorrow with the USA and, you know, whatever the case may be. It was just, okay, we're in this together and I've got the ability to to ask questions if I if I feel the need to and know that that the that my world that was that I, I thought was there is still there. You know, my advisors are still there. They haven't packed up shop. They haven't closed down. The, the economies aren't, aren't gone. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow in a bartering system and sell some chickens, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of what the conversation um, ended up coming back from our clients about, just that feeling of connectedness. And we, we all want that as humans. We want that connectedness, that relatedness. And so any of the messaging that you're giving during times like this is how do you tap into that? How do you bring that back to 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 giving people the warm and fuzzies and um and and taking it away from from all of that other craziness that's happening, which is that's our our space to deal with. They shouldn't have to take on the the emotive side of it as much because they know they've got specialists in that area. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it sounds like you guys have got a really nice mix then. So you've got some of those broader sort of one-to-many type communications going on, so group Zoom and, and other content that you're pushing out, uh, but also seems like you're topping and tailing that with, uh, I suspect, just a heck of a lot of time on the phone. Is that right? Or, <laughs> uh, you know, how do you get that really personal message across? Because, um, you know, that's not something that you quite walk away from uh, you know, after a Zoom call. Or yeah. as it was in during COVID, you know, your fifty fourth Zoom call for the day. Well, we did we did a lot of one to many during that space, so it allowed us to, you know, we'd have one, you know, one or two advisors, and we might have had fifty clients on those Zoom calls as well too. So most of it was a one one to many, 
but it gave the ability then for us to um, continue to increase the content that we were sending out in the other areas. So during that space of time, yeah, we we actually didn't shy away from it. We said, well, if we're if we're used to sending out blogs once a once a week, we we're going to be sending them out every other day now, um, and and just increasing the load that's there so that people feel like they're always connected and can pick up the phone. So then, yeah, we we would find that we would have a lot more of those one to one phone calls and emails, but it was more so going, hey, this was really great. I was worried about this, and now I'm feeling this. Um, because the content was going to them, so it, it was. Con- it's definitely being content heavy um, is is key. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I I would like to know if there's been a time where a client has gone to cash uh, in yeah. thinking back over your careers. Can you think of a time where somebody's made, or maybe not gone to cash, but made some market call which you didn't agree with? If so, you know why do you think that was the case, and is there anything you'd do differently? Because uh, it doesn't always doesn't always go the way you want. Sometimes people make d- decisions that aren't in their interest. Um, can you tell me about any examples when that's happened? Yeah, I, I do have an example where that's happened. Um, I mean, I, it's like I said at the start, I I started in the global financial crisis, so the the reality was that I I actually saw more of the case where clients had made a decision to go to cash previous to coming to Allman Partners. So maybe they, right. were, they were self-led and they'd gone to cash and then they came back five years later and went, gee whiz, I'm now well behind the eight ball. And we, we've all got those cases. We know that that yeah. happens. But but I, I do have a, a case as well where I had a client that um, was getting a lot of information from other sources about um, being tactical and, and reverting to cash during um, periods Right before market volatility might have might have occurred, might have um, didn't didn't actually in this case, but um, and that's that is hard because again it's where the emotion gets let in to say that well I've got all this conflicting information out there and I I'm hearing this crib room talk and everybody's telling me that the the next GFC is coming and I've got to move to cash I I can't do anything other than this because that's all I feel comfortable with and yes you know that's trying as an advisor because it didn't matter how many different ways you want to spell out that it's it could be a wealth destroying decision um, sometimes they need to go through those those learnings themselves um and unfortunately it, it was the case in this instance they reverted to cash um they um uh, they actually disengaged from from services and went elsewhere and then ended up coming back and it wasn't that long actually it was only about 18 months later and oh actually we <laughs> we learned our lesson that probably wasn't the best thing we've missed out on some market <laughs> movement and we're back in so um so it does happen but again if you have a really strong sense of what your um, investment philosophy is and you have really strong buy into that, that's about the best equipped that you can be in that space, right? You know, if you, because clients are going to pick that up. If you don't have conviction in what you're saying um, and what your beliefs are, your your body language, your tone, it's going to portray it. It's going to give that away. And, you know, that clients will still make some of those decisions at times. But if you, if you truly are sitting in a room and you can't with conviction say that this is the the best thing for you, then you probably need to do some research and get yourself comfortable with <laughs> with the new investment philosophy that you you can take your clients through. Yeah, yeah. I mean that, that that's fascinating. And there's been some other conversations I know been done on the podcast and content recently about the importance of an investment philosophy and and why you need to have one and. I suspect you're right in that uh, when the when the pressure's on, uh, it can show the cracks in someone's investment philosophy, and some of those inconsistencies can surface, and it can make it really, really hard to sit in front of a client because if you had maybe spent your previous conversations being very optimistic about you know why you should invest and what markets might give you, and you're staring down the barrel of some you know pretty bad losses and you didn't predict that, then it's yeah, it, it, it makes it hard to say with any conviction that the right thing is to stay in, invested when you don't actually know, and neither do you, by the way, you know, or neither do I, none of us actually know that it's going to give a better outcome, but I guess you're working within a framework that says we don't know and it is uncertain, but chances are this is still the best thing for you and we're happy to stick with that regardless of you know whatever has you know, just most recently sort of jumped upon the headlines. 
um, which, by the way, has been jumping on headlines for the last hundred years. <laughs> it's not <laughs> as if it's you know wonderfully new or novel. You know the the specifics might be, but you know the behavioural part it certainly is not. Absolutely right. And and again, what we feel really strongly about is key messaging um, being there the whole way through. So if you've if you've sent a message to your clients up front. That message should be there through review meetings, through good market periods, through bad market periods, through the lot, you know, through changes to their life. Just, just said with a slightly different tilt. Um, we, you know, we have a we have a toolbox that we use for all of our advisors so that are all saying the same things. Kels, maybe you want to talk a little to um, to some of the, you know, some of the what we actually have in the toolbox there. Yeah, so we've got a number of different slides that we revert to in in different situations, I guess, and. There's one, for instance, when we're talking about um, diversification in your portfolio, as an example, where um, we're looking at each share on the ASX 300 at a previous point in time, um, and then we'll talk to one of those shares that perhaps is is no longer there. And in terms of a real life example, we actually had a client that had a large, large chunk of their capital invested into ABC Learning. Um, ABC Learning Centre quite a number of years back now, and this was a share that didn't actually do too badly before the GFC. And when they came to our firm, there was some education that was given around the risk of not diversifying that particular share. And that can be a really hard thing to accept, particularly when they've had really good returns in the past um, on that single or a couple of shares that they may have had in their portfolio. But in the end, after the education was actually provided, the client could see that there was an inherent risk in their portfolio. And talking about, you know, years later, the ABC was actually delisted. So having those things that you can pull out and having the really good visuals attached to those is what we're finding really helps with our clients so that they can see, you know, yes, you had good returns. Um, it was on there and, and now it's not. It's very a simple message, um, but sometimes it's it's the simple ones that are the most powerful. And, and what we do quite a lot is um, take that toolbox. So, you know, our toolbox has a beer out of different information, but, and, and we, we, we've heard it all before, you know, it's if you've got if you've got the tools and then you've got the scripts that go along with it, so you know that you're saying the same thing and the same messaging and it's rote, you know, you, it just, it's it's natural to you. And then having those stories that you can attach to it, because whenever you can give a real life example, it's going to make people feel like that's that's closer to home. I can see what benefits that that's going to provide to me. And, and I can be one of the ones that you can help through those periods of time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is this is an interesting sort of flip side. Uh, I mean, when we talk about market turmoil, like everybody assumes that that's all negative. Um, you can also have things that go tumultuously well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and absolutely. and you have the you know have the flip side of that where you you can have very concentrated risks, and you almost have to come up from the yeah you know, come at it from the entirely other direction, where you've got you try to convince somebody out of positivity. Um, rather than convincing someone out of negativity, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I, I would love to know, uh, is there anything that you feel that you do specifically different in that scenario where you're trying to help people recognize that maybe concentrated positions they've had for historical reasons might not always be the, the best thing for them and they should think about diversifying or or even just standard rebalancing of taking taking money off the table when things have done well and, and rebalancing it into um, maybe asset classes that haven't, you know, that that's not always an easy thing to do either. Yeah. Can you tell me more about that? And is there anything different that you do or is it still back to focusing on goals? What, what do you do there? Yeah, it, it's a it's one that we probably see quite a lot, particularly in our region, because we we live in at, we're we're both based in Mackay office, so we're a black coal mining region, and so there's actually um, quite a lot of exposure to BHP Billiton here um, because of um, employee share schemes and those kinds of things with the with the mining sector. Um, right. So, uh, and that's a, that's interesting, particularly for those that have been working for you know the last thirty years, uh, because they did take up BHP shares when they were a couple of dollars, <laughs> and we know where BHP Billiton is now. Um, yeah. And the 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 positive emotion that they've attached to that is, well, I've made I've made my wealth that way. So you're absolutely right. You know the the now how how can I disconnect from something that's been so successful to me to date but it's not we don't have any secret source in that way it's really just talking about where where the dimensions not only just the diversification but one of the keys that we believe in is where dimensions of return comes from right and so if you can explain to the client why they've been successful previously and why that may not be the the case going forward because 
you know, they've been accumulating all during their lifetime and they took up a shareholding that was a small shareholding at the start and is now quite a quite a growth oriented stock at this point in time has a large share price you know during has done well pays good dividends but um is that going to be the right mix for you into the future and then yes exactly bringing it back to the goals and saying okay if the next if the next decade is looking like a transition into retirement or whatever the case may be um you need to switch gears. You need to get to a position now that you're not just aiming for this growth, which this stock may or may not give you into the future because it's made some good growth already. But you now need to switch into a stage where you're you've got liquidity, we've got diversification and and defensive assets and and property and all those different asset classes built in there so that um, it does not matter what happens with a BHP built and or whatever the stock may be into the future. So, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing particularly special in there. It's just conviction in the messages that you know are true for all of your clients. Um, And for advisors that, that, you know, have a, have a strong belief in, uh, in tactical asset allocation or whatever it may be, you know, um, again, it's about how 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 are you bringing those to the forefront and making sure that you've got something that works for your clients through all conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, look at at the time of recording here. You know, we've got tensions sort of flaring in in the Middle East. We've got a reasonably dicey looking Chinese economy and some you know uh, not too crash hot looking property sector over there and worries about contagion and. And uh, you know the ongoing worry about uh, a recession in the U.S. and uh, interest rates coming out of the U.S. and how that's going to affect their economy. What sort of things would you encourage? Maybe an advisor who's earlier on in their careers. Uh, you know they're looking ahead at you know what you could arguably say is true of almost any year in financial markets. Sadly, uh, but. Uh, this is the world we live in. What what would you encourage them to focus on in their client communications uh, if they've gone through, built a reasonable technical expertise, are starting to get in front of clients? How would you encourage them to think about those key messages or what are the main things you would encourage them to do? Yeah, and that's a really great point, Brendan. What we've been trying to do over the past few years is really build out um, what we call a, a refer to as an advisor excellence program. Um, so anyone that we do have that's going through the professional year or perhaps just, you know, starting as an advisor at Allman Partners and have been previously somewhere else, um, effectively collates all the different tools that we have in that toolbox, including, you know, all the presentations and the conversations so that they can actually go through that learning process of how do we then deliver that message. So we spent a bit of time um, recording ourselves doing that. Um, so that you know you've got something to base that conversation on, so we can make sure that the message is the same, no matter how many advisors that you have. Um, and that we found that really, really useful because you can get the exposure in meetings. But if you're not having exposure to all the different types of questions that you can get, we've found that the ex- the advisor excellence program has been a really good way to kind of tackle all of those things to get people really well prepared for the type of conversations to have and or what are the key messages um, to talk towards in those in those meetings. And there's some there's some really good content as well too. You know, um, I mean, there's so much of it out there because, uh, like you say, there's a lot that's going on with the world today and with markets today and um, and the economies and and but so much has happened in the past too. And we as humans forget about it really quickly, right? So, mm-hmm. um, COVID already seems like it was it was so long ago, even though it was only a few years back now. And then if we think back to the global financial crisis, well, for, for, for some advisors, they didn't go through the global financial crisis, like you say, and so that's not something that that um, that they've been able to relate to. And and we can go back before that, you know, we can go to the Twin Towers crash, we can go back to the dot-com bust and tulips and all of those different things in history. But I well, always that's think a that, long way back. <laughs> I know, right? But, but this is what I think is really, really good is that if you do – go back and look through history and realize that there have been so many different things that have been thrown at investors over the space of time. We've had huge levels of interest many, many years back. We have had recessions. We have had all these things. And if you have a look at that story and then go, well, knowing what I know about the fact that that uncertainty exists and it's real, what type of information do I need to equip myself with to feel confident that it doesn't matter which one of these things is going to be thrown at us next. I'm giving my clients the highest likelihood of 
doing what they want to be doing, right? It doesn't have to be a guarantee because nothing's guaranteed. But if I have the highest likelihood that I can get them there, things are going to change over time. They're going to happen. Yeah. Kelsey, was... anything, anything you'd add to that, Kelsey? Or... No, probably not. I think what it all brings back to, it, it is in our messaging and it is kind of accepting that it, it's just part of the journey that you go on and just making that really clear to clients and making sure that all of our advisors, you know, as Tanil had referred to before, you know, really buy into that investment philosophy um, because then you've got that conviction, which is easier to then build that trust. If you really believe in something, that will shine through um, and the clients will pick up on that. And if they can see that you're confident, they'll certainly feel a lot more confident. And one thing I would say as well is that um, if you don't have um, a strong network of those others that are around your clients, that's something that you should really get to because there's nothing worse than giving messaging to a client only for them to seek out um, the advice of another specialist in their in their space, whether that's a mortgage broker, an accountant, a solicitor, whatever it may be, and they're giving a different set of messages. Um, and if they're, if they're different to yours, that's going to be hard for the client to rectify. So surrounding with like-minded specialists and educating your centers of influence um, is a really good way to make sure that your clients are getting the continued right type of messaging. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point, Neil. It, are there any sort of final closing thoughts? It's been a, been a great conversation. We really appreciate you sharing uh, all the things that you guys are doing and all in partners. Um, sound, sounds wonderful and you're giving clients a great great experience through through all those bits and pieces um, that we've mentioned today. But is there is there any final thoughts that you would uh, give to the advisor community about helping clients through through market turmoil? I just think it's um, doing what you do really well and continuing to communicate. Don't shy away from it. Be on the front foot. Put a lot out there, all the different mediums, and um, your clients will be completely confident in you. Brilliant. Well, Kelsey, Tanil, thank you so much for joining me this morning, for sharing your, your thoughts and experience and tools. It's been a pleasure, and we'll speak again soon. Thanks for having us, Brendan. Thank you.